We want to have an op wanted to have an opportunity to have the candidates from there come here and to share with us their vision of how they're going to make sure that all of the citizens in this city participate in its great wealth and its richness. We do see every day at ABCD that 25, 35% of the people in the poverty, family of four making less than $25,000 a year. They're struggling. They're not benefiting by the new economy. They're not benefiting by the new Boston, the downtown, the seaport. And that's fine, and, but by being left behind, they lose hope and that opportunity is also going to be there for them. <coughs> so we are a city, we are a community, and I can't tell you after being over 40 years of doing what we do at ABCD, how important the person is who takes the mayor's job in Boston. There's nothing that the mayor of this city does not touch. Public housing, transportation, hospitals, schools, everything. And all of the people we at ABCD serve, and mostly, mostly of color, even though poverty is our color, most of the people we see at ABCD, almost 100,000 are people of color. And the next mayor, I hope, will keep that in mind, step up to the plate, and come up with visions for us. I want to have a very informative afternoon here at ABCD. And as Jen said, this afternoon's forum is going to give our mayoral candidates that are here an opportunity to talk about their specific plans to reduce income inequality in Boston's neighborhoods. And I'm going to introduce the candidates. Some will be coming in, but let's start with uh, some that are here right now. John Connolly, current at-large Boston City Councilor and Chair of the Education Committee. Rob Gonsalvo, District 5 City Councilor and Chair of the Committee on Housing. Charles Clemens, businessman and co-founder of radio station Touch 106.1 FM. Bill Walzak, founding president of the Codman Square Health Center and co-founder of the Codman Academy Charter School. And Marty Walsh, 13th Suffolk State Representative and Chair of the House Committee on Ethics. And as our other candidates come in, Who's here? Felix Sanorio. Felix Arroyo, an at-large Boston City Councilor and Chair of the Committee on Labor, Youth Affairs, and Health. All right, now, uh, before we get started, happy with the ground rules. First of all, I'd like to ask everyone in the room to make sure your phone is off. <coughs> O-F-F, that means everyone. Put it on vibrate, but we don't want to hear any ringing cell phones. And then to the candidates. Each candidate uh, was given a random seat number as they arrived. In the opening round, each candidate will answer the same opening question in one minute. Then in rounds two and three, randomly selected groups of three candidates will have 90 seconds to answer randomly selected questions solicited from voters by ABCD until every candidate has had a chance to answer the question. And if time permits, we'll have around four members of the audience will have the chance to ask the candidates questions. Again, candidates will have 90 seconds to respond. At the end, each candidate will have one minute to answer the same closing question. Now, we're allowing short answers, obviously, because we have lots of folks to uh, hear from. So please, gentlemen, bear with us. And there's a timer right here in the front row who will keep you on track, right? Um, she will alert you when half of the time is up. It will nicely beep. And it will nicely beep. And then once the full time is up, you'll hear a bell, 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 bell. Now, in his speech commemorating the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, President Obama noted 
Dr. King explained that the goals of African Americans then were identical to the working people of all races, decent wages, fair working conditions, livable housing, old age security, health and welfare measures, conditions in which families can grow and have education for their children and respect in the community. And the question, how will you build decent jobs in Boston's lower income neighborhoods? And we'll start with the candidate that has the number one. You have one minute, please. Uh, but one thing in particular, when I took over the building trades, I created a program called Building Pathways, a, a program for women and people of color to get into the building trades. I'm proud to say that we're able to create 54 jobs in a very short period of time. That program is still going. I still get time, okay. That program is still going, and as a matter of fact, uh, we've partnered with ABCD to, with the one two grants to be able to put, bring women into the trades. And two classes ago, we had an all-female class, all-women class. And the caveat here is that every single person that graduates this program gets 100% placement into the building trades. And I've had many, many success stories of folks that have gone into the trades. I want to take that as mayor of the city of Austin, put that program into our high schools, and give young people the opportunity, scores of them, the opportunity to get into the building trades if they do not go into college. Thank you very much. One minute. Yes. Stop, stop. Sorry. We'll, we'll yes. Okay. Bill Walzak, uh, that uh, opening question to you. How will you build decent jobs in Boston? Probably the most important thing that the Cotton Square Health Center, which is the uh, one, one of the agencies that I founded, did was reconceptualize the disease that we were fighting to be poverty which led us in the direction of education and uh, me uh, co-founding two high schools in Boston. I think it's really important that we look at income disparity in our city and look at that as the major problem that we're facing because in fact we are driving people out of our city. Uh, and in order to be able to resolve that, we need to be able to create opportunities for people that are coming out of our neighborhoods. My major proposal on this is education and my main, since I have 18 seconds left, uh, my major component of my education policy is career academies in our high schools in 11th and 12th grades that are going to be directly connected to businesses, academe, and, and uh, the healthcare institutions so that we can actually put kids on a track to careers rather than just a diploma out of our high schools. Thank you, Michael. The next question will be to Mr. Charles Clemens, the opening question. Sir, how will you build decent jobs in Boston's lower income neighborhoods? Karen, thank you for the question. Uh, and I love speaking truth to the perceived power. The jobs are here. However, we have to understand that in the city of Boston, we're not true, we're not one Boston, we're two Bostons. We have the haves and the have nots. We have those communities that are being served, and we have those commu those communities that need more services. Well, it's time for us to stop providing services, more services, to the communities that need more services. And as mayor of the city of Boston, I won't use my bully pulpit, but I will make sure that I use my executive power to make sure that we start doing the right thing. We start making sure that we invest in our children. We make sure that when it comes to the Boston residency job policy, stop having those companies um, hiring people from Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine. But hire the people that are in our community and understanding that we have different skill levels in our community and we have to address those different skill levels. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Consalvo, how will you build decent jobs in Boston's lower income neighborhoods? I think it starts first with being the CEO and the leader of the city and understanding that a strong foundation of fiscal prosperity, a strong budget, and a strong bottom line is what draws businesses here. You've got to have the businesses to create the jobs. And so having, making Boston an inviting place for businesses to come will be priority number one by maintaining our strong fiscal background that brings jobs, white collar, blue collar, and construction jobs. And we're going to insist that those businesses don't just locate downtown and in the Seaport District. They look at attractive options out in our neighborhood so local people can work in their neighborhoods at those jobs. It's also about our schools. As a dad with kids in the public schools, we're going to invest in our schools so that every child is prepared to go on to high school or college or to a career in the trades through Vogue Tech and a new Vogue Tech for the 21st century. As mayor, I'll increase summer jobs and year-round jobs by 15%. So I'll put my money where my mouth is as the mayor of this city so we can get more kids working. And finally, we have to go after the issue of kids who are out of school and are unemployed and underemployed. We have to job train them, give them financial literacy, school, literacy skills, and get them back to work. So, thanks, Karen. It's always great to be here in the Melnia Cast Room where I came uh, many times as a board member at ABCD and before that as 
an attorney providing pro bono legal services here and to see many of my old friends. And uh, I think where we start when we get to this is uh, we need to invest more in workforce training, adult education, and vocational education. We need to partner with our community-based organizations and nonprofits like ABCD uh, to get that done. How do you pay for it always becomes the question. And what I would say is we want to make sure we're supporting new and small businesses because those are the growth businesses that create jobs. And when they say to elected officials, I'll stay if you keep the rent and the taxes low, I want to say we'll work to spread innovation so we keep the rent low. We'll work on tax increment financing so we keep the taxes low. But I need you to invest in our community-based organizations and workforce training. That's how we're going to get that done and connect that pipeline of economic opportunity for every Boston resident. But let's not kid ourselves. If we really want to solve this in the long haul, we need to transform our Boston public schools. And that's why I am running for mayor, because we need to make sure we give every child a high quality education and get every child on a K-12 pathway to college and career or a vocational pathway to a skilled high wage job. Thank you. Elisa Arroyo, how will you build decent jobs in Boston, Boston's lower income neighborhoods? Nice job, you said exactly how my mom said it. Gracias. <laughs> My name is Felix Royoma. Over a decade of experience as an organizer and as your city councilor, as an organizer, I work towards, uh, my work was around ending the term working poor. Those two words should never be together. Janitors were making $9 an hour when we started. Today they make 16 and in two years they will be making $18 an hour. No benefits, today full family health insurance. But it's also about creating good jobs. I have a plan that will do that called Invest in Boston which takes a billion dollars of the deposits that the city has in banks today and says we will only do business with banks that invest in our neighborhoods, that lend to small businesses, that lend to homeowners. I understand the most violent thing that happens in our neighbors is poverty. And I understand that closing the achievement gap, that the achievement gap is the civil rights issue of our time and closing it is one of my priorities. That's how we'll work to end poverty in our city. I appreciate the time and the attention. Thank you very much. Joining us are Charles Yancey, District 4 City Councilor and Dean of the City Council, and also Charlotte Golar Ritchie, former state representative who was also Chief of the City of Boston's Housing and Neighborhood Development. There are a number of things I would do. First of all, I would make sure that all businesses that receive support from city government uh, have, has a provision to provide employment opportunities for our youth. I believe that uh, youth employment is key to success. I remember when I was working at the Katz Pharmacy on the corner of Blue Hill Avenue and Quincy Street, where I had the opportunity to shake Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s hand, uh, it was a very important boost to me, not only economically, where I was able to actually give my family a few dollars a week out of, out of my pay, but also develop a sense of responsibility, which I think has contributed uh, greatly to my success and should that opportunity to be provided to other young people, I think they will be equally successful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Charlotte Golar Ritchie, how will you build decent jobs in Boston's lower income neighborhoods? Thank you, Karen, and thank you everyone here. I am sorry to be a little bit tardy, and I am going to have to dash off to the next thing, but I would not want to miss this forum. John, you know that I believe in what ABCD does. You and Sharon and Michael and all of you here do wonderful work. And I have worked with you side by side in a number of housing developments on weatherization projects, senior housing, and so many things when I was Chief of Housing Director of the Department of Neighborhood Development. And it probably doesn't hurt that I found out during the course of my time that I was a distant cousin of Bob Cord. But I'm going to work on Bob's for Boston Jobs for Residents. Um, a youth affairs office I'm going to establish at the cabinet level. Um, I will absolutely work on vocational education to make sure that those 30,000 units of housing have people, local people, working on those housing units. I will make sure that any policy any uh, around jobs is going to be able to withstand a legal challenge. We're going to have a strong procurement program. We're going to connect residents, neighborhoods to the downtown, the innovation district, seaport district, and much more. Audience. And the first question is this. The National Gambling Impact Study Commission estimates problem gamblers roughly double within 50 miles of a new casino. If a casino does come to East Boston, how will you prevent it from being an economic drain on the already thin wallets of many Boston residents? Charles Yancey, you'll have 90 seconds. First of, all, first of all, I believe, one of the reasons I believe we should have a 
citywide vote rather than simply a vote in East Boston is precisely because of this question. The impact of that casino it could be devastating to many, many families, particularly those who may suffer from a gambling addiction. So I would make sure that we have institutions in place in the Boston Public Health Commission and other agencies as part of the mitigation process so that we can assist those families who will be suffering the negative impact of the casino. On the other hand, I will also insist that employment opportunities be pervasive. That everyone in the city of Boston will have the opportunity to work at the casino at higher wages. I believe that um, obviously casinos is a double-edged sword. It's not the preferable uh, form of economic development, but the reality is that casino will be located either in Boston or in Revere. And Revere, we get the same negative impact without the positive benefit. So that's why I um, lean to a support of the casino, but I believe everyone in the city of Boston should weigh in because everyone will be paying the cost. Not as great as East Boston in some instances, but certainly when it comes to public support of infrastructure and public safety services, it's going to be, it's going to pervade the entire city of Boston. Very nice. Thank you. So when I uh, look at the mitigation agreement that uh, will be voted upon, I think one concern I see is that there's not enough specifics relative to how we're going to deal with addiction. Obviously, uh, a large portion of the revenues that will flow back to both the East Boston community and to the city of Boston uh, should be dedicated uh, to dealing with addiction. But we need to think about this from a citywide perspective in all aspects of addiction because addiction, mental health, and trauma are the drivers on destabilizing our communities uh, and having direct links uh, to crime. And this is about having a holistic approach on all aspects of addiction, whether we're talking about drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever the case may be. <laughs> the Boston Public Health Commission has done some good work on this. Uh, relatively speaking, but we haven't brought it to scale. That's why when I announced that I was running for mayor, I said I wanted to find a cabinet level Office of Recovery Services, and their sole job would be to scale up recovery infrastructure in this city, because we can have all the outreach workers in the world. But if you're doing that outreach, and you find someone and they're ready to be in recovery, but you don't have a bed for them, they're not gonna get into recovery. That's a challenge many cities face, but this is the one city in the world with world-class health resources. We should never have this problem in Boston so that when you're ready to be in recovery, you can't access a bed or you need to know a politician to get access to the bed. I want to change that. And so whatever aspect of addiction we're talking about, I want to use an officer recovery services so everyone can access the treatment they need. Thank you. Bill Walzak, if a casino does come to East Boston, how will you prevent it? from being an economic drain on the wallets of Bostonians? Uh, mitigation is a funny term, isn't it? To talk about, we're coming to an agreement between the city of Boston and Suffolk Downs. <coughs> mitigation means lessening. Uh, we're going to deal with the dramatic impact it's going to have on crime and vice and gambling addiction. Well, I have one answer to that. Why have it? Why can't we just stop it? And we can stop it. And people say, saying, oh, this is a done deal. No, it's not a done deal. That license doesn't get issued until April. And as a result, the new mayor will have a very strong role in determining how that comes about or doesn't come about. And I've read the gambling legislation, and I know that the new mayor can take a stand against having that casino's license issued for Suffolk Downs. Now, we talk about jobs, but the jobs that casinos pay are very low-income jobs. You know, an average of $22,400 a year. Try living in the city of Boston on $22,400 a year. We've already talked about poverty. We've talked about $25,000 being the poverty line. So what we need to do is we need to prevent the gambling casino from coming to our city and taking money away from the people who we care about, the people that live in our neighborhoods. We know that it's not going to be people from Dubai or from Paris or from London and flying in to gamble in Boston. People don't do that. It'll be people that are coming on the blue line through the orange line or red line to get over there and gamble their, their uh, money away. This is something we can stop, and I'm the candidate up here that can stop it. Thank you. A two-bedroom Boston apartment rents for $1,500 a month. Many cannot afford this. The question is, what should the city do? Should rent control be brought back? And randomly selected, we'll have Marty Walsh respond first. 
you know, one of the things that we talked about was that there's been a big lot of talk in Boston about micro units. And micro units is certainly not the answer. So 400 square foot apartment for 1700 bucks a month, you're better off getting three roommates and paying for a bigger place. Uh, so we're talking about one thing we want to do is get colleges and universities to get students back on campus. That's one of the first things we have to do. We have to allow them the opportunity to build dorms on their property. And if they don't have space in their property, they have to be able to enter into a public-private partnership. That will, that will put more housing supply on the market. We also have to look at artist housing. And that, that's one, when the Four Point Channel was developed, a lot of artists lost their house and lost their workspace. And we have to look at that as well. Those are low-income jobs that they work at. We need to be able to create more, more artist housing within our neighborhoods. Also look at, we a lot of discussion about economic development here and incubators and incubator startup companies. Look at building housing where startup companies can share a common workspace so people can come in, live in, live in an apartment with a common workspace. It will help bring the cost down. And we also have to come up with more housing. We have to build more workforce housing. One, one of my plans is that we build housing on city lots. We, we charge the, the cost of the construction, the land costs are free. We put a cap on it where people live there for 10 years, and the apartments that are rented, we're able to cap them so, so that it's a form of rent control, but we're able to cap them so the land, landlord will be able to still pay his, his or her mortgage, but an opportunity. We could put thousands of units on, and the benefit for the city is we put that piece of land back on the tax rolls. Thank you. Rob Gonzalo, what should the city do? Should rent control be brought back? Look, the answer is we need to build more housing. Whether there's rent control or not, the way you get to lowering rent and to getting more units out there is to build more housing. So as mayor, we're gonna continue the legacy of building housing in our city. We need to increase our linkage formula. As the chair of housing and the trustee of the Neighborhood Housing Trust, which spends millions of dollars on affordable housing, it's time we raise the linkage formula and the inclusionary zoning formula to give more money to affordable housing in our city. We also need to take inclusionary zoning out of the BRA and give it to the Department of Neighborhood Development, who are the housing experts, who is working with the housing community. The BRA aren't the housing experts. We need a transparent process which allows uh, more opportunity for folks to get access to that capital to build affordable housing. We need to address the gap between the 80 percent AMI and the 120 percent. If you're 80 percent or below, you qualify for affordable housing. 120 percent and above is market rate and higher. This is a gap of people falling through the cracks who are <coughs> middle income workers who can barely make ends meet and, and getting jobs in our city. We need housing programs and capital and incentive programs to incentivize developers to build housing for that group of folks who are getting shut out of the system and shut out of our city. As mayor, I'll do that through our inclusionary zoning at the BRA. And we need to take advantage of our transit-oriented development along lines like the Fairmont line, which is in my neighborhood and goes through my district. Be creative about how we build market rate, affordable, and retail along our transit lines. And finally, hold our federal partners and the federal government accountable for the sequestration. They will not balance the federal budgets on the backs of HUD and affordable housing in our city. And as mayor, I'll scream from the loud mountains, loudest mountaintops to prevent it. Thank you. So some of you may remember back in 1994 when there was the question on the ballot about the abolition of rent control. Um, many of you here opposed the demise of rent control, and I was among them. And I know that there was an issue regarding whether or not residents should be means, means tested and so forth because people who were wealthy were getting the benefits of rent control. But the reason we have rent control is because we did, we're trying to avoid precisely the problem we're faced now. But the voters did speak. So what I have been doing throughout my career in housing is to increase the supply of affordable housing. And I know that you all have gone down to Washington to fight sequestration to fight cuts to CDBG and home funds and all of the resources that we need to create housing in the city. If I am mayor, I will be there to fight with you. Furthermore, I will push hard that the focus has to be on the poorest of the poor. It has to be on our struggling people, our homeless people. Who, we were asked questions in other debates about panhandlers. People who have mental illness and substance abuse need a safe place to stay. And I will be an advocate for the poor here in the city of Boston. And of course we want to attract people who can get jobs here and be part of the middle class. That goes without saying. We know how to create housing across the board, but I want you to know here at ABCD, because you are poverty fighters, that I will be here with you arm lock along that path to fight poverty here in the city. In this next round, we'll have uh, two candidates. Uh, the statistic first. This past tax season, ABCD and the Boston EITC Coalition, currently located within the BRA, 
did free tax preparation for over 11,500 households and helped them recoup over $17.5 million. The question, as you adjust the BRA, what are the plans for the 25 partner EITC coalition? How will you help Boston's low income taxpayers negotiate the complex state and federal tax system? And Charles Clemens will have you respond first. We have two Bostons. We have those that are being served, and we have those that are being underserved. And, and as mayor of the city of Boston, I will make sure that those services that are needed for those communities will be placed in those communities. However, we also have to understand that when you hear these numbers, a million dollars, well, and, and, and we hear about the middle class. Well, I'm not part of the middle class. I'm part of that class that works hard every day, that has to struggle to figure out, am I going to have to pay the rent, or do I have to take and put my child into a private school? So it's time for us to start doing the right thing and understanding that when we have these services for our community, we listen to the community. If they need more help, well, Mayor Clemens is going to give them more help. I'm the type of person that has always created things out of nothing, and I've always spoke truth to the perceived power. And I humbly ask for your support on September 24th. Your vote. I'm the first name on the ballot. <laughs> um, Mr. Arroyo. As you adjust the BRA, what are your plans for the 25 partner organizations in the EITC? And how are you going to help Boston's sure. low-income taxpayers negotiate sure. the system? Sure. I know the program. I've supported it. I've helped promote it. I've helped move it. I've had an email blast. I've, I've gone out to neighborhoods and, and, and talked about the program and, and the good work that it does in helping those uh, navigate our system and do their taxes. And as mayor, uh, I have every interest in the world in continuing to support that program. Um, haven't thought about whether or not it would remain in the BRA. And it's the first time I've been posed this question. I suspect it would stay. My reconstruction of the BRA is more around community uh, control in our development process. What I want to do to the Boston Redevelopment Authority, um, when I you know go around the city as a city councilor and as a candidate for mayor, I rarely find anyone who says, you know, we do well in the city. We do planning neighborhoods very well. I always feel included. And I always feel really good about how a project and a development ends up in my neighborhood. I never hear that. What I want is to hear that. And so I want to take planning out of the BRA, uh, put it in control of our neighborhoods, allow them to plan in their neighborhoods, and then have the BRA develop the project. I have no interest in messing around with the EITC program. In fact, I very much support it. But it goes further. To root that question, city has to work for everybody. City has to work for those uh, doing well, economically, and those not doing well. City has to work for those who speak English as a first language. Y eso es lo que no habla en inglés como su primer idioma. That's what these programs matter to me. It's not just promoting them in the dominant language or in the dominant culture. It's promoting them in the culture and the language that people speak and live by. I can do that as mayor, and in fact, I will. Federal budget cuts are real in Massachusetts. 712,880 fewer Meals on Wheels were delivered to seniors this past year. That is, of course, a lot of people without food. With sequestration and other federal funding cuts, these meals and other nutrition services have been cut. What will you do to help elders obtain healthy, nutritious food? Um, our Congress is not able to get anything done. Washington is uh, completely flummoxed as to being the source of solutions for the problems, especially urban areas, especially of poor people. And so uh, I think we need to uh, regroup and determine that it is our region or our state or our city that has to deal with these issues. Uh, obviously, I you know, spent uh, 30 years next to Kit Clark Senior Services and the lunch program in Cobbin Square. And I understand how important it is, the 10,000 meals that go out of there for, uh, for senior citizens uh, every, you know, every day. And it's obviously extremely important that we make sure that our senior citizens continue to have the access to the resources. So how do we do that? Well, I think it's important that the state has to start stepping up and dealing with the, the problems of sequestration. So if we're going to be able to have um, a system of care that, you know, that connects our health care system and uh, our so social services, senior services, then we need to reconceptualize how we're going to do that without federal involvement. 
my goal would be as mayor to make sure that as a state and as a region and as a city that we come up with a plan that allows us to be able to move forward and be able to reallocate resources based on the needs of our people in Boston and actually cut areas where we don't think it's got, we're getting the kind of value out of it. Thank you. So I would look at our locally uh, grown movement here in Boston, look at a lot of our work around greening Boston and creating food co-ops around Boston and try and create partnerships that way, again, leveraging community-based organizations as a way to improve uh, both uh, access to food and food justice uh, as a driving principle there, but also access to healthy, high-quality uh, food. I'll just use one example of a creative partnership here. My daughter goes to the Trotter School on Humboldt Ave in Roxbury. Uh, once one of the great schools in BPS fell apart 40 years ago. Today it's in the midst of a dramatic, uh, fell apart over the past decade. Today it's in the midst of a dramatic turnaround. But we have a poverty rate there, well over 90% of the families, one of the highest rates of homeless families there. Uh, we run a, uh, a food bank uh, and a uh, food uh, uh, program uh, kitchen uh, once, uh, once a month, I believe, uh, there. And many of the families participate, but we've done that by establishing a partnership uh, with Target. We need to rely on partnerships like that and ask more from uh, those who are benefiting from all the great parts of Boston to help those who are living in a Boston that isn't so great. Charles Yancey, uh, in light of sequestration, what will you do to help elders obtain healthy, nutritious food? Well, that's a major challenge, obviously, uh, Karen. Um, but I will certainly work with uh, many of our organizations in private and for-profit. You know, it's a sad reality that every day uh, food is literally thrown away. Good, nutritious food is thrown away. And we have organizations like uh, Fair Foods who are trying to step in the breach, but I think it should be much more organized, and I would certainly look towards ABCD working with the city, city of Boston to come up with a mechanism whereby some of that food, the nutritious food, the unexpired food, can uh, make its way into uh, Meals on Wheels type programs uh, given that the federal government has stepped away. I would also encourage greater partnership with our uh, friends at the state level uh, to work with us to close the gap and uh, take a look at what opportunities we have within city government to find some resources to provide meals for our seniors. Listen, Boston is not a poor city. It's not an impoverished city. In very, in very real sense, we have it's a city of the very rich and unfortunately it's very poor. I believe that the generosity of spirit exists within the city of Boston, and we saw some evidence of that after the <coughs> horrific marathon bombing. And I think that spirit uh, can be tapped to help us in this issue as well. Joining us are Michael Ross.